All right, so let's, uh, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's turn to Our Lady, who is very close to John, the beloved disciple who wrote the book of Revelation, and asked for her powerful intercession as together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so folks, we're going into, uh, we're continuing in uh, Revelation chapter 2, and last time we finished chapter 1, and um, you know, I was sitting there thinking, like, this, this class could go on for 21 weeks at this rate, but I really don't want to rush, you know, through, through the book of Revelation, because it's one of those things that's so packed with information, and it's one of the most difficult books to read. And so we're jumping into the seven letters, uh, where John addresses the seven churches um, in the book of Revelation. And uh, you'll notice, I just want you to notice sort of the schema and how the, how the letters are written. And uh, he'll address the church, and you'll probably see in your Bible the name of the church that he's addressing. The first will be Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. And then he'll talk about, he usually starts the letter with a, an encouragement. He, ta- he, he commends them about the strengths that they've, that they've uh, exhibited, right? He's like, I'm really proud of you because of X, Y, and Z. And it's almost like, you know, it's like you're bringing uh, one of your employees in and you have to kind of correct them. Like, hey, you're doing a great job and I really think you're working well for the company. And then there's this, but <laughs> he goes into the failures. And so he'll address the failures that they are that he's that he's upset about that our Lord is addressing, saying this is good, but this is bad, and then he gives them instructions. He will, he'll tell them and us what we're supposed to do if we find ourselves in this situation, and then there's promises to those who are faithful. And at the end of each letter, you'll realize that there is a promise that Jesus Christ gives to those that listen to His word. Okay, so pretty much every one of the letters is going to have that rhythm. So, number one is strengths. Number uh, no, number one is the church. Number two is the strengths. The third is the failures. Fourth is the instructions, and fifth is the promises to those who are faithful. All right. So let's jump into uh, let's go to Ephesus. Now, if you open your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter two, all right. And it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now, let's stop there. Remember, we talked about this issue with the angel. It's either the guardian angel of the, of the church, but more, probably more, probably, he's, uh, more pro- uh, probably it's more going to be the, the bishop of that particular church. So the angel, when you see that, more than likely he's addressing, Jesus is addressing the bishop of that particular church. And the bishop is the head of that church is the one who is the voice of Christ in that particular area, right? So, to the angel of the church, Ephesus, write. He goes on to say, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Okay, so what do we see there? He's, uh, he, he, he addresses the church, but then he talks about their strengths. Right, and what does he say that the strengths of Ephesus? He go, he said this. I know your deeds, and he says your hard work, right, and your and your perseverance and your deeds. So like your your hard work, your your uh, and your perseverance. And he goes on to say, and I know that you cannot tolerate uh, wicked people that have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. Okay, so those that's the that's the strength, and we'll go into that in detail. And uh, and he goes, found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. So Ephesus, that's a tough church. They've been through some hardships, right? And he says, I commend you for this. And maybe he's commending you. You know, we're going through a rough time in the church, and he's saying to you, to you Ephesians, so to speak, that you're persevering and you're not tolerating wickedness, right? And you're going through a hardship, right? So he's commending them. And then he says, yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Okay, so what is it? What's the what's the failure? They've lost the love that they had at first, and we'll get into that. What does that mean in in in, in uh, specifically? All right, so that's the failure. 
You're doing great works in your, wor in your, in your deeds. You're not, you're not falling into bad doctrine and you're not becoming a heretic. But your spirituality and your love, your interior life has grown cold. You're not praying well. It's become mechanical, right? And then he goes on to say, and then he goes into the instructions. Notice the instructions. He says this, if you do not repent, I go, no, he says, uh, he goes, repent and do the things you did at first. All right, so that's the instruction. He's going to say, repent. We're going to go into that word. And do, he says, and do uh, the things you did at first. Okay? And then finally, the uh, promises, well, I guess there's also, uh, there's, there's, there's also, with every promise is also a warning. Okay? So there's a good and bad outcome, whether or not people change. The warning essentially is this, is whoever, he says this, is that, um, if you do not repent, if you don't do what I say, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then finally, the promises. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Okay. So let's break that all down. Let's start with Ephesus. A little background on Ephesus. All right, so uh, first off is that uh, Ephesus is the mother church of the region. It's the biggest one. All right, so this is the, this is the queen of all the churches, the biggest one. And he's, John is writing to the bishop of Ephesus. All right, and, um, and so he goes into, and we're going to these failures, is where you go into first the strengths. Uh, we notice he says, uh, in my translation, it says your hard work. What does it say in your translation? I know your what? I know your, works and your, labors. your works and your labors, right? So he kind of, like, your works and your labors, those are kind of two words that are similar. But then he also talks about their perseverance, okay? So what, what they're experiencing is like they're going through, uh, it, it's hard work trying to stay Catholic, right? Back in the time of Ephesus. All right. Remember, when, when John's talking to them, he's also talking to what? To what? To us. And let's be honest, we're in modern Ephesus, right? And we're finding it very difficult to practice our faith. And, and a lot of us are working hard to try to raise your kids or keep them in the church. And maybe you're, you're seeing them drift. And you're like, this is, you know, I'm, I feel like giving up. And, and he says, I commend, right? I commend your perseverance. And I know your hard works. And, uh, and, and, and the thing he also says is, he says, and I know also your perseverance, right? Now, perseverance, you know, this is a very important virtue, right? St. Jose Maria uh, used to say that to, uh, to begin, uh, uh, you know, he said that uh, his use, the conversion happens at a moment, but sanctification takes a lifetime. And I want you to think about this for a moment. When did you decide that you were truly going to live a life in Christ. Where you, you just said, you know, I'm tired of being an idiot. <laughs> I'm trying to try, I'm tired of just doing my own thing and I'm not gonna disobey God and, and I'm gonna actually be a Catholic, you know, and, and not just get the sacraments, but actually do what it says. Right? I mean and he says, and, and he's telling us if you've decided, he says, Hey, uh, thank you. You know, and, and you've worked hard and, and you haven't done it perfectly, but you, he the Lord is saying, like but I, what I really am proud about is your perseverance, that you haven't given up, right? What does Satan want us, want, wants, wants us to give up, right? He wants us to stop and to say, oh, the, the, literally, to hell with it, right? And um, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, who she, she's buried not too far from here, right, in Emmitsburg. And, um, you know, she had, you know, she lost her husband. You know, I think she had four, five kids at the time. She was only like 20, or maybe maybe a little bit old, maybe 25 at the time. Uh, you know, she comes back and then she becomes Catholic. She gets ostracized by her family. She ends up uh, starting in the first Catholic school, and and then her kids left the church. I mean, it was just all kinds of crazy stuff she experienced. And she says this. She says, "You think it's very hard to leave a life of such restraint unless you keep your eye of faith always open. Perseverance," she says, "is a great grace." To go on gaining and advancing every day, we must be resolute and bear and suffer as our 
blessed forerunners did, which of them gained heaven without a struggle? All right? And I think that's the message for us. None of us are going to make it to heaven without a struggle. All right? And in the catechism, it's, it talks about the spiritual life. And I talked about this in the daily catechism, which we posted maybe many weeks from now. It's like week 60. Is that it calls the spiritual life because of concupiscence, because of the effects of original sin, dour combat. Like every day is just spiritual warfare. And our Lord simply says to the Ephesians, as to us, thank you for what? Your perseverance. Right? And uh, so that's, that's the encouragement. That's the encouragement to us. If, like, if everyone in this room is really fighting the fight, God is saying, I know your works. And I'm proud of you. And I, I, I thank you for your perseverance. And I know you've wanted to give up. But, you know, you stayed in that marriage. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, you didn't give up on your kid. And you've, you've, you, your prayer got dry and you kept doing it. Okay? But then, what is, what's, the, what's the failure? And this, I, this line of scripture, brothers and sisters, always gets me. He says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Now just sit, step back for a moment in prayer. Haven't we had times in our spiritual life where we can almost feel the Lord tell us, like, where's that love you used, used to have for me? Right? You know, and, and look at how far you've fallen. You know, from where you, you know. And I think, too, is, you know, we all have that experience when maybe you went to a, a Life in the Spirit seminar or you, you, know, you went to a Bible study or you, you went on a retreat and you're on fire. And, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, a month, two months later, it's back to the same old. <laughs> You know, and the Lord, you know, cries out from heaven, where's the love you first had? And remember, it's just like a marriage, you know, our relationship, we're, what, are we, what are we striving for? This mystical marriage with God. And anyone who's been in a marriage, you know, you go through periods like this where, you know, you first met and you, you googly-eyed and all excited and you went down the aisle and <laughs> had the honeymoon and then, yeah, your passes and you look at each other and you say, where's that love we used to have for each other? And, and what happens is we, at that point, a person has to make that decision. Am, am I going to really love? Am I going to move forward? Right? Um, they lost the devotion. Now, what are sins against God's love? The Catechism says there are several sins against God's love because that's what he's correcting them for, right? And in a sense, he's also correcting us. One is indifference. Is indifference to God? You know, I think that's probably this uh, a big thing. Apathy. Uh, I think, especially among the young today, and, and some of the, I mean, think about it. some of your brothers and sisters. There, there's you know, they're they're up in age, and they could they could give a hoot about God. And there's this indifference, and you know, maybe they were altar servers. You know, a lot of times when you know someone comes up to me, Father, I used to, I went to 12 years of Catholic high, you know, Catholic school, and I was an altar server. And right away, you know what? They don't go to church anymore, <laughs> right? And what does God say to them? Where's the love you used to have for me? Notice how far you've fallen. You don't even know what the Eucharist is anymore. You haven't prayed a rosary since you were in third grade. Where's the love you used to have for me, he says. Right? And um, then there's ingratitude. Like we have ingratitude towards God's goodness is, is a form of a lack of love to God, it says in the Catechism. Another thing which we'll get in later when we talk about the church in Laodicea is lukewarmness is also a form of a lack of love. When we just like, eh, going through the motions... We're not on fire. We just, you know, we do it, but there's no, there's no pizzazz in it. You know, we'll read a couple of things. We'll pray a rosary, but it's, it's checking the box. You know, it's, there's no love in it. It's just done with, it's just, it's just doing it. You know, a lukewarmness, not fighting against venial sins. You know, well, as long as it's not a mortal sin, I, you know, it doesn't matter. I can do this and we'll get in that later. But lukewarmness and it, sloth and exadia. Uh, these are all sort of forms of a lack of love. And so he's telling the Ephesians as he's telling us, once again, here's your failure. You've lost that love. So now the instruction, and he goes on to say, how do we get out of this? If we find ourselves where we're, we're just going through the motions or we're just checking the box or maybe we're not doing anything at all, he says, first, what? Remember. Remember what? 
Remember what it was like when you were on fire. Go back to where you loved God. And what were you doing at that time to express your love for God? Just remember. And that's true with a marriage. Like if your marriage is going south, what do you do? Remember. What would, you know, a lot of, a lot of like couples, you know, they're married for 20 years. They haven't been on a date for seven years. Like a lot of people come for spirit. Oh, my marriage stinks. Well, when's the last time you took your wife out for dinner? Oh, gosh. Uh, seven years ago? But what do you think is going to happen in that marriage? But take that also into our spiritual life. You know, you can't, you can't expect a, a billion dollar spiritual life with a 10 cent prayer life. <laughs> right? I mean, in other words, it's like, where is that love? You remember, he says. And he says, because God's great love for the Ephesians, they were made alive in Christ and their new life exhibited with passion and gratitude and the passion for our sa saviors just spilled out to all those around them. But now it's just kind of deadened. So they're good people. And the people in the church are good people. You're good people. But the question that Jesus asks them and us is what? Am I in love? Am I in love? Remember. Right? Number two. He says, repent and do the things you did at first. All right. And what are the things we used to do when we were in love? Now, what does the word repent mean? The, the word repent in, in Greek, is you probably heard this a gazillion times, the Greek word for repent, uh, I don't know if I can see this, but I'll write it here. It's metanoia. It's an important word in Christianity. And it, it really means to, to turn around. It, it means to turn away from sin, but to turn towards God. Metanoia. It means a sort of a total change. Repent means to turn away from the evil you're doing and turn back to God. Okay? And, um, and so that's what we have to do. And he says, and do the deeds that you used to do when you're in love. And I always tell people when their spiritual life stinks, I said, well, okay, remember the time you were in love with God. What were you doing? And simply do that again. And that's what Jesus Christ says to what? The Ephesians. So remember and then what? Repent. That's how we get out of this failure of that love we've lost at first. Okay? And then what's the warning? The warning here, uh, well, uh, well, I guess, you know, that, that's the instructions, right? The instructions, remember and repent. Now we go to the promises, but also remember, there's also always a warning. He's like, okay, if you don't do this, we've got problems, right? And that's also, with all the good news, there's also bad news. Right? As there's good news that there is heaven, there's also hell. Right? And so God, being a loving, truthful, loving, merciful God, is always encouraging us to do better, as he did to the Ephesians. He also warns us. And he says this. He says, I will remove your lampstand. Okay? I will remove your lampstand. Now, what does this mean? Uh, the lampstand was sort of like a symbolic of the congregation and the light during liturgy, during the sacred liturgy. There's a lampstand. And basically he's saying, if you all lose your love, your, your congregation will disperse. It will die. Now, let's look at a lot of parishes around here. And let's look how they used to be 50 years ago. And look, look at how they are now. Like St. Peter's and Waldorf. I mean, they used to have thousands of families. This place, 2,000 families. I mean, even the churches that are sort of doing okay are still suffering. Where's the love? And you know what? I think because of years of lukewarmness and poor preaching and all this other stuff, and congregations are dying. The Catholic Church is dispersing. The pews are emptying. What do we need? Fire. <laughs> We need fire again. We need to repent and do the things we used to do. What are the things they did in the 1950s that we're not doing? Well, back in the 1950s, every Catholic went to confession every week. Now, now Catholics go never, if ever. A lot of Catholics used to pray the rosary. A lot of people don't never pray the rosary. The only time you see the rosary is when they're buried and it's around their hands. On their, in their coffin. It's too late. You know, I mean, there just were things that people used to do they don't do anymore. And God says, remember and repent 
And if you don't, I'll take the lampstand out of you, which means your congregation, your church, will die. That's what Jesus is saying. We don't want that to happen, right? <laughs> we want it you know, to continue. And then he says this. He says, but he also gives him another commendation. So the Lord's like, okay, I just beat you up. Now, another commendation. He says this, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So what do we have to figure out? What was the practice of the Nicolaitans? And what did Jesus hate? Because if Jesus hates it, we also must what? How many know it's a good idea to love what Jesus loves and to hate what Jesus hates? <laughs> you know? But the problem is, a lot of people love what Jesus hates and they hate what Jesus loves. So let's dive into this. What, what is this? Now, who are the Nicolaitans? We'll, we'll find them again in another letter, but what were they doing? Now, the Nicolaitans, they, uh, they were started by one of the original seven deacons, uh, which is Nicholas. Uh, he's in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Can someone just turn to that real quick? Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And just, uh, if you could, uh, I didn't, why didn't I not bring my Bible here? Uh, yeah, no, I have it written here. It says this. Listen to this. This is Acts chapter 6 when they, they chose the first seven deacons. All right? And it goes on to say this. It goes on to say, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert for Judaism. Now, Nicholas was one of the seven deacons. Now, what happened to Nicholas, all right, is that he became a heretic. Does anyone know what a heretic is? All right, heretic is a bad word. You don't want to be a heretic. It's a sin against the first commandment. It's when someone, uh, it basically, uh, canon law defines it as following. When someone um, obstinately denies a, a truth of the faith that they must believe, and worse, teaches it as so. Okay, so for instance, a heretic would be someone who says, well, you know, Jesus isn't really God. He was just a prophet. That would be heresy. Or that the Eucharist is not really Jesus. It's just a symbol, right? That would be something awful for a priest or a deacon to preach. Well, what did Nicholas preach? What was his problem? Well, St. Clement of Alexandria puts it this way. The Nicolaitans, he said, this saint, he said that they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. So they were not, whatever he was preaching <laughs> made his, his parishioners start acting like goats. <laughs> so obviously it wasn't good. Now, um, and the, basically what, what, you know, what they were doing is, um, is uh, essentially there was two things they were guilty of. They were getting mixed with um, pagan rituals where they ate meat sacrificed to pagan gods. So they were kind of getting involved with New Age stuff. And we're going to talk about that later when we get to one of the other churches. But they are also, they are also um, teaching that sexual sin is not a sin. And so in these, in these little rituals, there was also uh, acts of fornication, uh, sex before marriage, and these other things. And basically they're just saying, ah, that's really not a sin anymore. Okay, and so a lot of people, they would go to Mass, but they were doing these sexual practices that Jesus hated, and he tells them, you're not doing that, I am proud of you, but I hate what the Nicolaitans are doing. All right, let's go to 2021, right? Um, uh, more than 230 bishops in, German, in Germany um, basically were saying that they were going to bless homosexual unions. So they would be modern day what? Nicolaitans, and what they're doing is exactly like this deacon was doing back in the, early, in the early church, leading hundreds upon hundreds or even thousands of people to sin. And the Vatican, in the document that they protested, it, it said, God does not bless sin. That came out, remember Pope Francis said that recently. He says, God does not bless sin, and these bishops, who are heretics, are doing exactly what God says he hates. And why do I say this? I'm tying in what happened back in Ephesus is also happening 
up north from Ephesus in Germany. And unfortunately, it's sneaking into the Catholic Church in the United States of America. Right? So, he says this, whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the victor I will give to, re to right to eat from the tree of life that is the garden of God. Now, so he's telling them, all right, he said this, he, he went back to some of the failures, and that was also accommodation, but now he goes to the promises. He says, if you go back to the love you first had, right, get back on fire, get back into a spiritual life, he says, this is the promise I give you, Ephesians, but also to us. He says that you, the victor, will eat from the tree of life that is the garden of God. What's the tree of life? Garden of Eden. There were two trees. The first tree is the, gar the tree of what? Good and evil. And the tree of life. Right? Now, why? Why? Did God not let Adam and Eve eat from the tree of eternal life? Because if they had eaten from that tree, the curse would have been eternal. And so out of his mercy, he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. But when we go back to heaven, guess what we'll be able to eat? The tree of eternal life. God's going to let us eat the fruit. Because that's our reward, is we'll be able to eat of that tree of eternal life for eternity. It's pretty good fruit, too. Tastes good, right? It's a banquet. It's beautiful, you know. And I, and that's the other thing is like brothers and sisters, we have to get it through our thick, thick skulls. The whole point of life is to get what, to heaven and to eat of the, the eat of the tree of life. To eat of the tree of life, and he promises this. The promise God makes to us and them is he says that, uh, that through Jesus' resurrection that evil will be destroyed and believers return to a restored paradise through the true tree of life. The tree of Eden was only a shadow of the true tree of life that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay? All right. So we went through uh, the Ephesians. Let's go to the next letter. All right. The next, the next church that we're going to talk to is Smyrna. All right? Uh, and, and let's read the text, and then we'll go. Once again, every letter has this thing. He, where, he, where Jesus, he, he addresses which church he's talking to. He'll talk about the strengths, then the failures, the instructions, and then the warning and promises. Every letter, when Jesus, he, Jesus does everything perfectly, and his letters are perfect, okay? And his letters have the same, remember, he's the Alpha and the B, Omega, the beginning and the end. It, it's like he's easy to read. Now let's read what, remember, Jesus, this is a letter from Christ. To the angel of the church of Smyrna. All right, stop. Who's the angel of Smyrna? The bishop, the bishop right? To the bishop of Smyrna. <laughs> to the bishops of Germany. <laughs> to the bishops of the United States. I say this. Right? To the, he calls them the angels. He says this. The first and the last. All right, what's that in Greek? The Alpha and the Omega who once came to life, says this, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but rather are members of the assembly of Satan. Uh, and then he goes, Do not be afraid of anything that you are going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will face an ordeal for ten days. Remain faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, the victor shall not be harmed by the second death. Okay? All right, so, all right, so let's, let's talk a little about uh, the church. The church is Smyrna, right? Uh, men called Smyrna the ornaments of Asia. Okay? It was a very, very beautiful city. Uh, it was very rich culturally. Um, it, it had a stadium where many, and this we're going to get to that later, they had sort of an Olympic stadium where the games, the Olympic games were held, where they had these huge, you know, gladiator fests and track, track meets and all these other, um, you know, fame, and thousands of people would come from around to watch these games. Um, it had a, one of the biggest, most magnificent public libraries in the entire world. Um, it was also a place of great music. Some of the greatest musicians came from Smyrna. And uh, one of the largest theaters in Asia Minor. So it was a very, it was almost like um, New York City. Okay, and it's like remember, you know, like you know, Times Square, the, the nice part. It was just a really classy town. Um, and so, uh, and he commends them because the com the commendation is essentially this. It's similar 
to what he's saying to the, what he said to the Ephesians is that they've been going through this really terrible persecution by the Jewish people. And they've gone through this great poverty. And once again, what is he commending them of? They're, they're, they're still in the game. They haven't what? Haven't given up. Right? They haven't lost their hope. And, um, and so I think one, once, uh, does anyone know what famous bishop was martyred in Smyrna? He's, a, he's one of the famous martyrs. Have any of you heard of St. Polycarp? Okay, yeah, St. Polycarp, uh, one of the most, he was, Polycarp was an actual a disciple of John. So John trained and probably ordained Polycarp as a bishop. So he's kind of, remember, when John's hearing this, he's like, my friend got killed that I put in Smyrna to lead the church. So this is a tough letter for John, but God is, is, is happy with Polycarp because Polycarp did not give up his faith even when he was uh, burned to death. I read a little, a, little, a little section from his death because this happened in Smyrna and implicitly he's also addressing what happened, what would, would happen to St. Polycarp. Okay, uh, basically it, it said this. Um, he was ordained by John the Apostle and he was burned alive in the city stadium. So that great stadium we talked about, they dragged him into the middle of this huge stadium. All these crowds were around to watch this. And um, he was 86 years old, right? I mean, can you imagine, you've got to have something wrong with you if you're going to burn an 86-year-old man. I mean, what kind of diabolical sense do you have to burn an 86-year-old man? Uh, if he would only denounce, and they, the Roman authorities offered to spare the life of him if he denounced Christ or offered a sacrifice to the emperor. Looking around the crowd and filled the stadium, St. Polycarp glared at them and shouted, down with the atheists. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like Braveheart, you know, like, if, if you just ask for mercy, you know, and he yells, freedom, you know, and he's just down with the atheist. And after he refusing to curse Christ and roundly condemning the elderly St. Paul, he miraculously survived the public burning, and then he killed him with a sword. So the burning didn't work because he was that tough, and then they stabbed him to death. Beautiful story. But he went to heaven. All right, so just background. Polycarp went through this. Now, he warns them. All right, so uh, the failures, I mean, he doesn't really, in this one, there's not too many failures, but I think what he's telling them is, you guys are losing hope, and I understand why, because you're going under a, a big persecution. Let's talk about some of the, rather than failures, maybe the better way of saying with, with the Smyrnans is more the sufferings they're going through. Now, what does Jesus say in the text? He talks about uh, the, this, this word, he, uh, the, I think the word in my Bible, it says, I know your tribulation. All right, um, let, me write, let me give you the Greek word for that. The Greek word for tribulation is thlipsis. Uh, I mean, uh, let me write this down. Uh, not that I don't know if you ever go back to this in Greek, but if you want to know what it is in Greek, that's the word for tribulation. Okay, and the the word means a crushing weight. So what they're going through is just it's oppressing them. It's like it's like you know someone put up you know I don't know a, a bunch of bricks on top of you and it's just weighing you down. And 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 Jesus is seeing that they're being weighed down by the suffering that they're encountering because they gave themselves to Him. Right? And a lot of Christians feel like that today. They feel this oppression, this crushing weight upon them. Right? And, and then he talks about the poverty. Now, the word in Greek, I won't, I won't bore you with the word in Greek, but it means uh, like destitution, not just like poverty, like I don't have some things, like I'm not as well off as someone else. This type of poverty that these Smyrnans are going through is like destitution, abject poverty. Like, we've got next to nothing. Now, why are they experiencing this poverty? Well, because, first off, were the first Christians, did they come from uh, a lot of money or were they from poor, poor class? Does anyone know? Yeah, a lot of the first, the first, first century Christianities, a lot of them were slaves. A lot of them came from lower, from lower classes. Uh, in, for them, like the Christianity was like a solution to all their problems. And the other problem is that the reason that the Smyrnas were poor is that the heathen mobs would attack Christian homes and basically just pillage them and loot them. So like out of nowhere, you're, you're having dinner and all of a sudden they're like, 
down with the Christians, and then, oh, you know, poor kids hide, and then, you know, they, they'd ransack their houses, take all their stuff. Now, back in, in ancient times, they didn't have life insurance and all this, you didn't, you didn't just call your insurance company like, hey, someone stole my laptop. You're like, well, good luck, you know? I mean, this is, we're talking, this is, this is ancient times. You didn't have those kinds of luxuries, all right? So if, if someone stole from you, that was it. I mean, if you caught them, but remember, and also the, the you know, the, the legal system wasn't necessarily that strong either, so you had a lot of problems, right? So they, they, they experience this poverty, right? And thirdly, he, what does he talk about is that some of them would suffer imprisonment. And what does he say here? He says that, let's go back to the text. He says this, is that um, he goes on to say that, um, do not be afraid do not be afraid of anything you are going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will face ordeal for 10 days. Okay, so let's, th let's talk about the 10 days. All right, 10 days, when you're biblically, that was an expression used at the time of Christ or during the time of John, which basically meant a, a, a short time that would end shortly. Okay, so he's, it's kind of like he's giving them hope. He's like, you're going to go to jail, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break you out of jail. But I think if you go deeper in it, when you're reading this spiritually in prayer, what is Jesus saying to us? That life's like a prison. But guess what? Jesus is going to go what? He's going to break us free. He'll break us free from prison and we'll get to go to heaven. There's no more suffering and pain and paying the price and all this. Like, we'll be set free. Like It's a short time. That will end. right? So I think, too, implicitly, Jesus is talking about just the prison of life. Because sometimes life can feel like what? Like a prison, right? But God said, don't worry. It's just a short time. It's nothing compared to what? Eternity, right? And um, now, the other thing we have to know, imprisonment, like going to prison in the time of Christ, I mean, and also in the time of John, uh, it was, I mean, these were not five-star hotels. You know, prisons right now are, are pretty, pretty good. They got weight rooms and you got pretty good food and ah, decent beds and showers. Uh, that was not ancient prisons. <laughs> I mean, you went to jail. I mean, yes, it, it, some never came out alive. It was almost like a death sentence. If you went to prison, sometimes you never got out. Right? So he just, I mean, our Lord just says, have courage. Now, uh, what are the instructions? Well, he, our Lord doesn't really, he doesn't give too many instructions to them. Um, he just says, well, yeah, he does. He says, here's, here's, here's his instructions. Ready? Very simple. Remain faithful till death. Now, let's, all right, let's step back and you're a Smyrnin. Oh, come on, you know, like, wait a minute. But that, he just says, like, just what? Remain faithful to death. But he's also telling who that? You and me. Just remain faithful to death. And I promise you, I promise you that you will receive a crown of life. Right? And maybe that's a great thing to pray about. Is like, you know, will I remain faithful to death? You know, that song, Faith of Our Fathers. We will remain fit until, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So I just thought I'd start learning the guitar, you know. I'll play that later. But anyway, um, it's a crown of life. Now, what's the crown of life? All right, let's, all right, let's look at the Greek word for this. The Greek word for crown of life is Stephanos. All right, Stephanos. It's like, almost like Stephen. S-T-E-P-H-A-O-N-S. Okay? And, and what it was, is it's, it was a crown that was given to someone after they, after they did something. They got, it, was a re, it was a reward for some kind of victory. It was a, it was a, a crown you got after some kind of event. Okay? And um, so, um, what, are, what are some of the examples of this? Um, well, once again, remember, what was one of the things that was in Smyrna? The big Olympic stadium. All right, so let's say there's a track meet in the stadium. You win. What did you receive as your as a reward? A Stephanos, a crown of life. And so they, they're like, you know, dun, 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 and they're like, come on up. And you go up, and they would take the crown of and place your head, and you would turn around, and oh, everyone would just cheer, and you're just, you know, looking at your crown. And, you know, you probably walked around the street and look at my crown, you know? <laughs> Got my Stefanos on, right? You know, this is whole crown of life. And it, it was just kind of like, it was like, ah, check out, that guy's got the crown, you know? It was like, these are bragging rights, right? And um, so it was, it was a victorious. And, but also, um, what he's talking about is, um, now the other thing is, in pagan temples, when a, when a person went into worship in a pagan temple, 
they actually had to wear a certain crown before they went in to worship the pagan gods. Okay, now obviously, uh, Jesus is saying, no, no, not that temple, but when you come to my temple, victorious, after you've won this victory over life, you know, you're going to, you know, you're winning this Olympic game, which is called life, and you're victorious, and all the saints are walking in, and St. Peter puts the Stephanos on your head, and all the saints are like, ah, oh, so there's cheering, and you're giving high fives to Padre Pio, and all the saints are walking through, right? And then you get to see who? Who? Your mom. No, just kidding. God, right? <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, it's like, what's heaven like? I get to see my mom, and I get to see my dad, and, and I get to play sports, and the weather's great. And you're like, and? You get to see God enter into his temple with the Stephanos, right? You've been victorious. And he says, this is what's waiting for you, for those who persevere till what? Till death, right? All right. Then he said, but then what's the warning? Um, oh, he also says this, you will not enter the second death. All right, what's the second death? Yeah, it's, it's hell, right? Second death. So... The early Christians had a saying that wisely expressed the concept of a double death and a double resurrection. This is what the early Christians used to say. Born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. <laughs> All right, try to write that down and try to figure that out. Born twice, die once. What's the, two, what's the two births? The first birth is our physical birth. What's the second birth? Baptism. Baptism, into eternal life. And then you die what? Once. And then it says, born once, die twice. Our body dies, but then our soul could possibly die eternally. The second death is, is damnation, right? But he says, those who persevere that have the Stephanos, the crown of life, you will not suffer what? The second death. Now, we'll get more into Hades and the burning fire later. Okay? Believe me, it gets a lot more graphic as the... As the as the, as the Bible progresses. Okay, so we got through that one. All right, I think, I think we're right on track to go through to Perger, Pergamum. All right, so now we're going to the third church. And now we go to the church of per, Pergam, Pergamum. All right, all right. So verse 12, let's read the text, and then we'll, we'll break it open. And it says, To the angel of the church of per, Pergamum, write this, The one with the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know that you live where Satan's throne is, and yet you hold fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. Kind of circle that Antipas, that, that name, okay? And, and that faithful witness, who was martyred among you where Satan lives. Yet I have a few things against you. You have some people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who instructed Balak to put a stumbling block before the Israelites to eat food sacrifices to autos and to play the harlot. Likewise, you also have some people who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We've already talked about them, right? The, this, this heresy is also stu snuck into Pergamum. Therefore, the instructions is what? Repent. We've already, it's kind of a similar thing. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and rage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the victor, here comes the promise, to the victor, he goes on to say, I shall give you some of the hidden man manna. All right, we're going to talk about that. What's the hidden manna? You probably know what that is. I'll give you some hidden manna. But then he goes on to say, I shall also give you a, a white amulet. Uh, now this is a, a white stone. What's this white stone you're going to receive? And then finally, Upon it's inscribed a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it. So uh, we'll get to that. The reward is a new name. Uh, we're going to get the hidden manna and this white rock and a new name. Okay. So, all right. Let's talk a little bit first about the church, Perga per Pergamum, and I might I might be butchering the pronunciation of that, but Pergamum was about uh, 60 miles north of Smyrna. And 15 miles from the coast, um, and it was in the Western Asia Minor, known um, as uh, it's a Roman province. And um, the, the thing about Pergamum was that it was built on this giant hill. So the thing that was fascinating about Pergamum is like, 
it was one of those places where every you just look down and there's the ocean and like you could see the sea in the distance and you kind of you felt like i mean if you were from that town you were like the king of the hill everything was have you ever been to assisi no yeah never assisi when you go up there you look down and you could see from the top you could see everyone is just you just feel like you know i'm in assisi and you could see down and and the lower towns you just felt kind of safe and secure and it, it had that kind of feeling it was just a and that was what it was known for. Um, it was uh, basically a leading culture and political center of the Roman Empire until the fourth century AD, a very sophisticated city, a center of Greek culture and education, a 200,000 volume library. Now why do they make a big deal? Why do they make a big deal about libraries back then? I mean, no one had books, right? So they had these I mean, when you had like if a city had a library, I mean, this is a place of culture and education. Now this is a, a place of just, you know, where it's really happening. And, uh, and it was a center of learning. And it was, they, they, it was also a place where they had a lot of parchment. And parchment is what they used to write on. So they had a lot of, a lot of stuff of learning. Uh, but also, one of the problems is it was one of the center of pagan cults. Like, there was a lot of pagan worship, okay? A lot of New Age stuff going on there. And that's where we're going to see where he says, it talks about Satan, because a lot of times when you get involved with these cultic practices, you're really inviting satanic uh, influences. Okay, all right, now, once again, every letter has this five-fold process. All right, we talked about the church. We just talked about the background. Now, Jesus always starts with what? He always starts with the good news. He's like, all right, this is what I'm proud of. You guys are doing a great job with this. And he starts with a commendation. What's the commendation? He basically says this, um, that you live near Satan's throne, but have remained what? Faithful. Okay? So you live sort of in this, right next to Satan, so to speak. And we're going to talk about what, who's Satan. Why do they say this is Satan's throne? But you stayed faithful. All right? Um, all right. So... And he also says they are faithful like Antipas, the faithful martyr, right? Now, the word witness, I think the word is witness, the faithful witness. Remember what the Greek word for, for martyr, for witness is? Martyrus, martyr. And Antipas was basically this famous martyr. Now, the problem with, this, with Antipas is that we don't know too much about him. Uh, but I, I, I believe he was most likely a bishop. He was killed in a very, you know, graphic way, and he was remembered. But other than that, we don't know too much about him. But the people of Pergamum then, he was a big deal. Okay, they all saw his martyrdom. They all loved Antipas. He was a beloved, I guess, a disciple of Christ. And so if, like, you were called Antipas, you were okay. All right, so it's almost like, you're just like John Paul II. Oh, okay. It was like this, this like, you're, you're in good, good company. Now... What's the warning? The warning is, some of you hold the teaching of Balaam, right? Who instructed Balak to put a stumbling block before the Israelites to eat food, sacrifice to idols, and to play the harlot. And likewise, you, some of you hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Okay, so let's break down a couple of things. And let's first figure out, <coughs> why does he call Pergamum? Why does he say the throne of Satan's there? Okay, now the Greek word for throne is... Thronos, not that that really matters, but um, that, you know, this is an allusion to this temple. There was a temple of Zeus, high, remember, Pergamum is high in the city, and there was this very famous temple of Zeus that you could see. So it was very prevalent, a lot of visitors there, okay? But this, it's not like, you know, you just go and, you know, it's not a museum. There's a lot of cultic, very graphic practices happening in that temple, okay? Uh, which is stirring up a lot of evil. And so, so one, one possible possibility is that Jesus is talking about this temple of Zeus where these pagan practices are happening. Um, it could be just basically all Pergamum because there were many cultic temples in that town. So basically he's saying the throne of Satan is the whole town. It's totally messed up. Okay, and you're living right in like sort of like Satan's headquarters. Did you know this? Where do you think more demonic um, uh, sort of cults are in the world? Where do you think, where do you think the most, most of them are in the, in the world? Take a guess. Holy Land. Not Holy Land. Rome. 
There are more cults, there's more demonic priests and cults in Rome than anywhere else in the world. Isn't that interesting? That the center of the church where there's great holiness, there's also what? The throne of Satan. Right? The exorcist of Rome who died a couple, three years ago, he did 76,000, 76,000 ex exorcisms of people in his, in, in his priesthood. Do the math. I mean, isn't that amazing? In Rome alone, Right, um, and now it could also refer to the community of the false Jews, uh, which it was called the synagogue of Satan. These unbelieving Jewish communities who rejected the Messiah and attacked the church. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about you know so so this is that's what the throne of Satan is. Okay, now let's go into the teaching of Balaam. All right, and he says some of you are holding the teaching of Balaam. Um, would someone do me the favor of reading? Or opening up to well, actually, rather than go the, the, the scripture quotes, it's from the book of Numbers. You can look at later. Let me give you the verses that you can look up later. Numbers chapter twenty-four, verses ten to twenty-five, and all of chapter twenty-five uh, speaks about Balaam. Okay, do any of you have any? I mean, I'm not sure if you have too much knowledge of the Old Testament or what we're talking about, but he's referencing something that happened in the Old Testament that's happening here in Pergamum. All right, so let's unpack what happened in the book of Numbers, uh, namely in Numbers 20, chapter 24. And uh, so let's just back up. Numbers is when, remember, the Israelites are going through the desert. And after 40 years in the wilderness, uh, the new generation of Israel was ready to take possession of the promised land. And Balak, the king of Moab, right? You know, in the song we say the Moabites, the king of Moab, uh, was afraid of the Israelites passing through his land, so he hired a prophet, Balaam. So Balaam was a, was, a, was a false prophet. Okay, are you with me? Okay, and it goes on. He asked them to curse the Israelites with destruction. Every time Balaam tried to curse Israel, God put a blessing for Israel in his mouth. So he's like, I bless. <laughs> like he's like, he's trying to do a curse, and God made him bless Israel. All right, so you can imagine. So you ever see the movie Liar, Liar, where like he, he just every he just all what he was really thinking comes out of his mouth. Imagine like the opposite. He's trying to curse the Israelites, but God makes him bless them. So he's like, and like the kings look like, wait a minute, that's not a curse. And he's like, he tries again, and he blesses Israel, like because God's like, you're not cursing my people. And so he just kind of he changed the the curse into a blessing. It's kind of funny, you know. And then it goes on to say, so every time he tried to curse Israel, God put a blessing for Israel in his mouth, profoundly, profoundly angry and King Balak. He's like, I hired you to curse him. But before Balaam gave up and returned to his home, he told Balak to use the oldest weapon known to destroy the Israelites. Guess what it was? Sex. <laughs> he says, why don't you get your, your, uh, your women, you know, your pagan women, to just destroy the, the Israelite men. And guess what? It was successful. <laughs> so he couldn't curse them, but he got, he just got, you know, some 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 Tootsies to go out there and destroy the whole the whole army. You know? <laughs> yeah. So the Moabite and the Mennonite women enticed the Israelite men into ritual prostitution to a false god. So basically, like they threw this party, all the Israelite men went to it, and they tricked, the women tricked. What Balaam, what Balak was trying, what, what Balaam was trying to do, the women did for him. They said, "Look, let's go to this party," and they did ritual prostitution. And then on top of that, they had all the Israelites sacrificed to this false god. And guess what happened to all the people? They're completely cursed. Right. So what happened? Uh, there, there are some things I want to keep out of this story. It's, it gets a little bit gross of like what exactly happened and how that happened. But let's just, um, you know. But after the sacrifice and orgies, they ate the meat of the animal sacrificed in the sacred meal. It's not a sacred meal. This demonic meal. And the sin of the Israelite men, in, in this case, was not only the sins of fornication, adultery, and sodomy with pagan women, but also eating the meat sacrificed to the false god, which amounted to the national adultery from the covenant with Yahweh. So... What's happening in Pergamum is some of the Catholic men are involved with Balaam. They're going to these places of 
fornication, they're eating the meat to, to pagan gods. Okay, and they also, what do you also say? They bought into the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And what was the Nicolaitans? Is that sexual, sexual sin is not a sin. So once again, it's all kind of tied together in this, this ugly package. Let's step back and let's look at Pergamum today. Have, have American Catholics, are they practicing the practice of Balaam? I'd say yes. All right, 8% of Catholics to say, say that contraception is morally wrong and 80% say it's either morally acceptable or not a moral issue at all. So I would say a vast majority of Catholic men and women today are worshiping Balaam. And then here's the other thing. It's, and this is, this is really the problem with modern society. And it happened then, it happens now. Two-thirds of U.S. Catholics. Now, I don't think these are people going to church, but Catholics, quote-unquote, say that homosexual behavior is either morally acceptable or not a moral issue at all. All right, so what happened to Pergamum is also happening to what? To our church today. And so God gives us a warning. He's... They, the modern, these are modern worship of Balaam and the Nicolaitans uh, like, is really happening today. And on a side note too is this, is that we as Catholics have to be careful of engaging in pagan practices, okay? And what's called divinization, all right? Let me just give, in the, in the first commandment, it talks about uh, things we should avoid. Now, there are certain practices that we should avoid that are kind of practice, kind of, kind of, uh, you ever like driven around 301, you see these houses as tarot cards, you know, and it says, you know, get your palm read. Okay. Like every time I drive past that, I just go like this and I bless it. Right. And uh, all my friends do the same thing. It's really funny when we're driving with like three blessings at once. <laughs> and, you know, and you see some doofus go in there and you're like, you know, what are you doing? And I, you know, I've, I've helped with exorcisms at times and a lot of times, I would say in most of the cases that I've helped, I don't do, I help, I assist, is when you interview the person, more than likely they got involved with some of these practices. They didn't know, they didn't know it was bad, but they invited evil spirits into them by engaging in these spiritual practices. Now the Catholic Church, and this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it simply says this, it says that all forms of divinization are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons. I think that's like an easy one. Like, don't like invoke Satan ever. Okay, uh, conjuring up the dead. Now that's a big thing. What do we call that? Where they, you know, like when you're trying to uh, my 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 dead ancestor. That is a bad. Seance. What do they call that? Seance. Yeah, seances. Yeah, th those are just you're 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 cruising for a bruising if you start doing that because you're not going to conjure up your dead grandma. It's going to be a demon used in grandma's voice, and it's going to kind of attack, attack your family. Um, uh, horoscopes, astrology, uh, palm reading, interpretation of omens, lots, phenomena of clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums. That's actually, that's actually a big thing. There was that, cat, that show that came out, The Catholic Medium. No such thing. Okay, like, uh, you know, there's, you know, they, they, you know, you don't. You don't um, uh, I had a friend that, you know, became a friend of mine because I helped her, but she was a medium and she had all kinds of spiritual problems with her. And I had to get another priest to pray with her because she was just all messed up in the head. And she did this for a living, right? And it took like two solid years to get her cleaned up from doing that. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and so these, these types of things, just basically avoid them because this is one of the problems and the failures of the of Pergamum. All right, so what is so we get, kind of, then we get into the instructions, uh, and, the, and the instructions basically is what? Let's go back. He says, let's go back to the go back to the text. He says this. Um, therefore, yeah, well, it's very it's two words. All right, what's his instructions? Therefore, what? Repent. Repent. Uh, okay, are we getting the message? <laughs> it's like it's very simple. Therefore, what? Repent. Repent. All right, turn away from these things and turn, once again, to what? To God. And I think in the sacred scripture, I mean, God's like reaching out to our Catholic church and say, hey, therefore what? Repent. And meanwhile, you know, we have Pachimama being <laughs> celebrated in the Vatican Gardens. It's like, wait a minute. That's what happened in Pergamum. Stop it. Repent. Right? All right. So 
He says he will, and, and he says, if not, he will come with the sword. He will conquer in judgment with his word, and the community will die. Okay, um, and so like in the time of in the time of Christ, there was a, you know there was a sword, right? And the sword, like a Roman, certain Romans were given this power where they, they there was a certain type of sword, and they could kill it. They were they were given the power to kill at will. Okay, so they some people were given that power to to spare life or to take life. But Jesus is saying, no, that's my sword because I have the power to what? To give life, but also to what? To take life. And so it's, it's sort of a severe warning. He's like, I will come with my sword, right? Therefore, you must what? Repent. And so I give you the sword of life, not the sword of what? Death. There's two sides to the sword. One gives life, one gives, de one gives death. Okay? Now, what, is, what are the promises those who are faithful? Um, he says this, whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the victor I shall give some of the hidden manna. I shall also give a white amulet upon which is inscribed a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Alright, so let's talk about these three things. What's the threefold, what's the threefold reward for Pergamum, but also for us, if we repent of these divinization and these practices of Bala, you get hidden manna, white amulet, and a new name. Okay, so let's start, let's do, let's do, uh, well, okay, hidden manna. All right, go back to the desert. What was the manna? The mysterious bread that God produced and to feed them in the desert to get them into heaven. For those that repent, we have the gift of what? The Eucharist. For those who repent of this, I will give you myself, the bread of life, the manna from heaven, to help you to, to restore your holiness and get you to heaven. When we get to heaven, there is no what? There's no Eucharist. Why? No need for it anymore. But the, but the new manna will bring us to heaven. It's the food of life that will bring us to eternal life. All right. How many have ever seen, uh, have you had the blessing of being able to see your parents when they get the last rites? You have? Okay. Did the priest give them communion at that point or was it too late? Like, it was unconscious. Okay, yeah, fair enough. But you got you saw the blessing on this was beautiful, right? Um, but if, uh, if if you ever see like their last communion, it's really beautiful. And well, when you give communion for the last time, it's called viaticum, and that means it comes from Latin, uh, for food for the journey, right? Um, and uh, my grandmother, I you know I saw her receive her communion and, like simultaneously eight days in a row before she died, and uh, you know and that, the, the she, last couple of days all she could eat was this new manna, the bread of life. Right, she actually became Catholic eight days before she died. So yeah, really, it's another story. Um, the other thing is this white amulet. What is the white amulet? Uh, this is um, it's a stone. And so, <clears throat> in the first century, uh, there was a practice that when you were invited to a feast, you would have to bring your white stone with you. So it was almost like you know your your uh, invitation. So a lot of times, like you get in the mail, like, hey, hey, honey, go check the mailbox, and you're like, what's in there? There's a stone, mom. Don't drop that. That's the amulet, because that would be your ticket to get into the banquet. And if you didn't have your amulet with the initials on it, you couldn't go to the feast. So what do you think the white stone symbolizes for us? It's our admission into the banquet of the Lamb, the eternal wedding feast in heaven. So he'll give us the white stone so that when we're like, God, all right, so we got two things now. We've got the Stephanos, the crown of life, and we got our stone. You got this and this, right? So one of the rewards is you'll get this white amulet and you're able to go into, into the feast. And then finally, this new name, okay? Um, what are we talking about there? Um, well, when we were confirmed, what did you receive? A new name, right? And when we go to heaven, I, I mean, are we going to have a new name? I think, I know it's, it's very interesting, but the, what it really means is like a new life, right? More than the name itself. But let's kind of step back. Who, who uh, in our Catholic church, when do people get new names? Well, religious brothers and sisters, right? So, you know, like, you know, the blue nuns, uh, they all have like these really long Marian names, you know? 
Sister Mary Immaculata, uh, you know, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? And she used to be Jenny, and now she's Sister Immaculata of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? And so they, what people do is, and they basically believe that that name was what Jesus whispered in their ears about what they should be. That's kind of like one of the beliefs of religious sisters. They think that Jesus gave them that new name, and that's the one they choose till they die. And, and I guess when they die, maybe that's their new name. But in, in essence, we all get a new name when we're baptized, and we have this new life, and so we're given this new identity as kings and queens in God's heavenly kingdom for those who once again repent and turn away from Balaam, Nicolaitans, and also these heretical practices, and also divinization, all these other things, right? So, what's the take home? Make sure you have your rock, get your white rock, get your new name, get your new manna, and get your Stephanos, right? Your crown of life for those that are victorious. Okay, all right, let's stop there. And we're, so we did three letters, and next week we're gonna go to the church of Thyatira, Laodicea, and two others, um, uh, and uh, they're, they're long letters. Actually, the next one is just a little, a little uh, sort of commercial. Thyatira is the smallest and most insignificant of the seven churches, and they get the longest letter, okay? So kind of ponder that. The insignificant church gets the what? The longest letter. And the biggest one gets what? The shortest. Okay, maybe there's something in there. Okay, let's say a let's Hail Mary, and then you can uh, rock and roll. Name the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay.